So I'll be, as Zach said, I'll be talking about um, our, about tree identification, um, native trees to Illinois, and we're going to start with, with the basics. So just a little background on me first. Um, I work for University of Illinois Extension Forestry. I coordinate the Southern Illinois Beginning Forest Landowner Program. And if you want to learn more about that program, you can find it on our Extension Forestry website. You can also email me if you want more info on that. In 2020, I received a Bachelor's of Science in Forestry from SIU Carbondale, and I'm currently working towards my Master's of Science in Forestry. And I have kind of a wide variety of experience related to forestry, but um, tree identification is definitely one of my favorite topics, so I'm pretty excited to talk about that today. So today we're going to cover an introduction to tree parts and terms, and then I'm going to go through 10 native tree species to kind of get you started on tree ID, and then we'll finish with resources for tree identification. So some of the stuff we're going to be looking at um, as far as tree parts and terms are the leaves, the stems, the buds, bark, flowers, and fruiting bodies, unique features, and then also location on the landscape. So starting with leaves, the kind of flat um, part of the leaf, the green kind of flat part, we call that the blade. The edge of the leaf, we call the margin. And then those lines that kind of go down the blade of the leaf, those are the veins. And these can all come in different shapes and arrangements. So these are some features we look at on the leaves. And then also what you might consider the leaf's stem, um, we call that the petiole. And those come in different lengths and um, kind of sizes as well. So we also look at that. Some leaves have lobes, which are kind of extending parts of the blade. And some have sinuses as well, which are these concave parts of the blade. We also look at the complexity of leaves. So um, this is kind of the amount of blades and the arrangement of blades on the leaf. So we have simple leaves where you just have one blade. We have trifoliate where you have an arrangement of three blades. We can have palmate, palmately compound leaves where you have an arrangement of five blades. And then pinnately compound is another one where you have multiple leaves. Well, in this case, we call them leaflets, the blades along this um, entire leaf. And so when you have a palmately compound leaf or um, trifoliate or pinnately compound leaf, those blades are called leaflets. And the stem is no longer called a petiole, but we call it a rachis. And then you can also have bipinnately compound leaves where you kind of have a second branching on the leaf. Um, so this entire um, item pictured here is the leaf. You can also have a third kind of branch off the leaf as well, which we call tripinnately compound leaves, but there aren't many of those around here. We also look at arrangement. So this is the arrangement of the leaves on the stem. You can have alternate arrangement where the leaves alternate down the stem. Opposite arrangement where you have two leaves coming out of the stem right across from each other. And then world arrangement, you have three or more leaves coming out at the same point on the stem. 
and alternate arrangement is going to be your most common arrangement. Looking at the stems, there's um, a variety of things we look at. So you can look at the color. So some trees like box elder have green stems. You can have brown, red, um, almost black colored stems. So we look at color. You can also look at the size or width of the stems. So that picture to the top right kind of shows you a gradient of widths with a hackberry stem on the left and a Kentucky coffee tree stem on the right. We can also look at form. So the bottom left there, that's an eastern redbud branch, and it kind of has a zigzagged form to the stem. Can look at lenticels. Lenticels are circular in uh, appearance, um, bumps or um, just circular spots on the stem that are used for gas exchange. And they come in a variety of colors and shapes. And some are raised and some are flat. So we look at those as another feature. You can also look at the pith of some stems to kind of indicate what species you're looking at. So that's a black walnut pith in the bottom right, and that's just the center of the stem. So you could take a pocket knife and kind of cut down the middle of a stem and reveal that pith. So you might have some that are chambered like this black walnut, some are just hollow. Um, some are spongy, so we look at things like that with the pith. And then some stems are slightly hairy, where others are smooth, so that's another feature we can look at. As far as the buds go, um, we have two kind of buds that we look at. We have terminal buds, which are going to be at the end of a branch, and then we have lateral buds, which are along the rest of the branch. Um, and below those lateral buds, you can have a, you will have a leaf scar if the leaves have shed off. And we look at those because they can come in different shapes and sizes as well to help indicate what species we're looking at. And then for the terminal buds, typically we look at the scales. So there's a variety of different scale types we can look at can have overlapping or imbricate scales, which is kind of like a, if you think of shingles on a roof, you can have paired valvate uh, scales, which is kind of like a duckbill, um, non-overlapping valvate where you have more than two scales, but they don't overlap each other. You can have cap-like, on like on sycamore where it's just one scale that kind of caps that entire bud. And you can also have naked or scaleless buds. We also look at bark. So um, this isn't an exhaustive list of the different bark types you'll come across, but these are pretty common. So um, smooth, like on American beach, Peeling or exfoliating is another name for it, like on river birch. Warty, it's kind of got bumps, kind of quirky looking bumps um, to the bark, like on hackberry. Blocky, you kind of have um, not quite square shapes, but kind of blocked shapes and to the bark, like on flowering dogwood ridged and furrowed. I like to think of um, like ridges and valleys with this one. Um, and sometimes the ridges will kind of crisscross each other and make almost diamond shapes, but not all ridges and furrows are that way. Some are more just straight up and down vertical. And then there's also platy, which is kind of like flat plates that um, peel outward either horizontally or vertically. Another feature that we can look at 
depending on the time of the year, are flowering and fruiting bodies. So here are just a few examples. So for flowers, I have the pawpaw, mimosa, and eastern redbud pictured there. Um, the pawpaw, you can look at, it has a, an arrangement of three petals on the outside and the inside, and they're in a dark red color. And you can also use the scent of this one. It kind of has a almost, it's a pretty unpleasant smell because it's a fly attracting flower. So it's almost like a garbage smell. Um, mimosa is pretty striking. Um, many of us have seen this flower, kind of a delicate looking tropical flower. Eastern redbud, it's in the legume family. So you got that um, banner, wing and keel kind of flower there. And then also the time of the year with these. So the pawpaw and Eastern redbud flower in the spring, kind of before the leaves have fully leafed out, whereas mimosa flowers more in the summer. We can look at the fruit as well. So um, a few examples I have here, Eastern hop horn beam. It's pretty appropriately named because it's got that hop looking um, fruiting body. There are various oak um, species with different acorns you can look at as well. So um, oaks can be one of those species that are kind of hard to differentiate. So if the acorns are present, that can kind of help you tell them apart. Kentucky coffee tree has a large legume that um, if you split it open, it kind of has a butterscotch smell to it. So that's a um, feature you can look at with that one. And then we're all familiar with gumballs from the sweet gum tree, I'm sure. And um, I know it's kind of, uh, it's it seems strange to call these fruiting bodies because we think of fruit like apples or bananas, but um, these are considered the fruit of the tree. So don't let that confuse you. Next, we'll look at some unique features. So um, this is just a short list of some of those that are common, but thorns, spines, and prickles. So that's a um, honey locust there in the bottom left pretty large thorns. Some trees have buttresses where the bottom will flare out. That's our um, state champion bald cypress there that I'm standing on. Can also have wings on stems. They're kind of these quirky, woody um, growth parts on stems, like on a uh, winged elm. And then another feature you can look at is um, marcescent habit. So deciduous trees typically lose their leaves. They die and fall off in the fall time, but some trees kind of hold on to the leaves even though they've kind of died. And American beech is one of those that's kind of known for that. A lot of our oak species do that as well. And then location on the landscape. So this is just a short list of some species that are kind of known to occur in these different um, locations. So bottomland, it's pretty common to see cottonwood, sycamore, willow, um, those moist music sites. So think of like mid slope areas, valleys, You'll find beech, northern red oak, sugar maple, tulip poplar, and then dry uplands. Blackjack oak is pretty exclusive to those dry uplands. Um, farkleberry, that's another fun one you'll find in those areas. And then there are some species that can be found in all three, like American elm, sassafras, black cherry, and even red maple. Um, so these are kind of just general rules of thumb. You'll sometimes find them in areas that you wouldn't expect, but this is kind of where they like to be. And with that, we'll go into our 10 trees to get you started. 
So number one is black walnut, Juglans nigra. It has alternate leaves, so they alternate down the stem. Pinnately compound with 15 to 23 leaflets. And they have a finely serrated margin, so kind of a um, jagged looking margin to those leaflets. And they're also fragrant. Um, it's kind of hard to describe the smell, but if you crush them, crush the leaf a little bit, it does have a kind of pungent, almost spicy kind of odor to it. And then for the buds and stems, the buds are non-overlapping valvate. So that's the scales on the bud. They're hairy and they're pale brown. The stem is also hairy and quite stout. It has a leaf scar that's typically described as a monkey face. So that's that top right photo there. And it has a brown chambered pith. The fruit is a nut. It's spherical in shape and gets up to two inches in diameter. And it's got a green husk that is also fragrant. It also smells um, like the leaves do. And then the bark is black or gray. Sometimes um, I've come across some that are pretty black. This is more of a gray example here pictured. It's thick and deeply furrowed, but sometimes more blocky in appearance. Number two is tulip poplar, Liriodendron tulipifera. The leaves are alternate again. They're simple, so you only have one leaf blade. They have a smooth margin with four broad lobes and the apex, which is actually at the bottom in this photo, so the top of the leaf, is truncate, so it's um, concave in shape. It's got a paired valvate duckbill bud. The stems are smooth and reddish brown. And it has these scars on the stem, so that kind of tan colored line there on the stem. It encircles the stem and those are left over from what are known as stipules, which are kind of like leafy appendages that can perform photosynthesis and protect new growth. So when those fall off, they leave this scar on the stem. It has cup-shaped flowers with six yellow-green petals and an orange base. They flower in May. And the fruit is about two and a half inches long and it's an aggregate of Samaras. The bark is gray to tan in color. And when they're young, they have what I've heard described as kind of a cantaloupe skin looking bark. I think that's a good description. Um, so that kind of middle top photo there is a immature tulip poplar. As they mature, they develop more deeply furrowed bark. And um, as they grow, you may notice these kind of triangular shaped, um, some people describe them as cat eyes, kind of, shapes on the bark and those are um, branch scars from where the old branches prune themselves off. Number three is white oak, Quercus alba. So the leaves are alternate on this one. They're simple and they have seven to nine rounded lobes. The buds are nearly round they have imbricate scales, so those kind of shingled looking scales, red to brown or gray in color, and they get up to an eighth of an inch long, so not very big. The stems are slender and smooth and somewhat shiny. The acorn gets up to three quarters of an inch long, and the cap covers about a quarter of the nut. 
the scales, so on that cap, um, those scales are oppressed. So they're kind of pulled tightly down to the cap. And these mature in the first growing season. So it only takes one growing season for them to fully develop. The bark can be kind of variable with white oak. So they can be gray or white with gray patches. And you can find flat, blocky or platy bark, or you can come across some that are quite shaggy in appearance like that middle photo there. Great bat habitat. Next is black oak, Quercus velutina. The leaves are alternate, simple. They have seven to nine bristle tipped lobes and the sinuses, so those concave parts between the lobes are very U-shaped. The buds are pointed, again, have imbricate scales and the buds are angular. So if you think of rolling a number two pencil in your fingers, that's what it feels like if you were to roll these buds in your fingers. They can be reddish brown in color or gray. They're hairy and they get up to a half an inch long, so much longer than those white oak buds. And the twigs are slender to rather stout and reddish brown in color. The fruit is an acorn and it gets up to three quarters of an inch long. The cap cover is just under half an inch of the nut, or just half of the nut in total. The scales on this one are not as oppressed like the white oak, so you might find them kind of fraying out from the cap. And these mature in two growing seasons. The bark can be black to gray in color, shallow to deeply furrowed, and can have a blocky look on the lower trunk, kind of like that top middle photo there. And the inner bark is also pretty orange in color, like that top right photo there. Number five is black cherry, Prunus serotina. It has alternate leaves. They're simple. The blades are oval or oblong in shape. It has a pointed tip and a finely serrated margin. And the leaves of black cherry are quite shiny or waxy looking. The buds are imbricate scaled, sharp pointed, dark brown to red and up to a quarter inch long. It has very slender stems that are brown in color with small white circular to horizontal lenticels. So on the smaller outer limbs, you'll see more of those circular lenticels, and then the more stout inner stems, you'll start to see the development of more horizontal lenticels. The flowers are white with five petals, and they're clustered and drooping on a raceme, so that's the kind of um, arrangement of the flowers and they flower in May, and the fruit is a reddish black droop. Young bark is smooth with horizontal white lenticels, and as they mature, they develop a scaly gray to black bark that uh, I've heard described as a burnt potato chip look. So that's how I always remembered it. Number six is American Elm. Ulmus americana. The leaves are alternate, simple. They're doubly serrated. So um, that photo there, kind of the middle left, it's zoomed in on the margin. They have kind of this larger serration with finer serrations within. So we call that doubly serrated. And they have somewhat of a scabrous upper side to the leaf, kind of like running your fingers across sandpaper. The buds are red, brown, and black in color and ovoid in shape. They have imbricate scales and they get up to a quarter of an inch in length. 
The stems are slender brown and often have a zigzag form to them. They're smooth or they can be slightly hairy. The fruit is a Samara and it's oval in shape. It has a hairy margin and a deep notch at the top. The bark is light or dark gray in color. It's furrowed, breaking into thin plates at maturity and has a slightly spongy feel to it. So if you push your thumb into the bark, it'll kind of give a little bit. And this is one that I will say has quite a lot of variation to the bark. So um, don't go solely off the bark with this one. Um, and don't go off of one feature with any of these trees. You're gonna wanna look at multiple to confirm what you're looking at. So this one, number seven is kind of a two for one. I wanted to cover ash, but I didn't know which one I should cover, so I decided to cover a couple with this one. So green and white ash. The leaves are opposite. They're pinnately compound and finely serrated on the margin. Green ash has seven to nine leaflets, and in the fall, the, the foliage will be a yellow-orange color. White ash has five, five to nine leaflets, and the fall color is purple. The stems are moderately slender and gray to brown with raised lenticels, so you can feel them as you, if you run your finger across the stem. The buds are rounded and wide on green ash. And they're dark brown and they sit on top of the leaf scar. So that left, left bud and leaf scar there pictured is the green ash. White ash has a rounded bud, brown to dark brown, and it sits inside of the leaf scar. So it's there on the right. And my supervisor um, has a saying that I think is kind of helpful to remember the difference between these two. You can't put a horseshoe on a green horse. So um, that right leaf scar kind of looks like a horseshoe on the white ash. So just remember that green ash does not have a horseshoe. You can't put a horseshoe on a green horse. The fruit of green and white ash is a Samara. It gets up to two and a half inches long. On green ash, they have a longer, more narrow seed, whereas white ash has a shorter stout seed. For both of these, they have ridged and furrowed bark that is light or dark gray to tan in color. White ash tends to have pointed ridges, whereas green ash will also have pointed ridges, but it'll also have areas typically that almost look like somebody shaved some of the bark off, like in that top right photo. Um, so like flat topped ridges. Don't confuse this with um, the signs of emerald ash borer. Um, it won't have that kind of blonding look to it. It'll still have the color of the outer bark. And then habitat is something that I haven't been mentioning with the others, but these two do occur in quite different habitats. So I wanted to mention Green ash is predominantly bottomland, while white ash is predominantly upland. Number eight is sycamore, platinus occidentalis. The leaves are alternate, simple. They have three to five lobes, and they're coarsely serrated. They have a cap-like scale on the bud, and the bud is actually enveloped by the petiole on this one. So you can kind of see that in those bottom two photos where I'm pulling a petiole off of the stem. It's exposing um, a bud that was kind of protected by the petiole. The stems are tan to light brown in color. 
They do have that zigzag form to them. And these ones also have stipules near the leaf bases. So that's that leafy appendage I mentioned before that tulip poplar also has. The fruiting bodies are known as an akeen and they're a rounded head of seeds and they are wind dispersed. So um, that kind of bottom right photo there in the left, that's what it looks like when these seed heads kind of break apart. They got this fibrous um, material connected to the seed that helps them become dispersed in the wind. The young bark is green to white and sometimes will have red in it as well and it's exfoliating or peeling. As they mature, they develop a scaly to blocky bark on the lower trunk, and we'll still have some of that exfoliating bark more in the crown of the tree on the upper branches. Number nine is sugar maple, Acer saccharum. This one has opposite leaves, it's a simple leaf and has three to five lobes, and it has a smooth margin. The buds are pointed and brown, has imbricate scales up to a quarter of an inch long. The stems are slender, smooth, and often have um, kind of a tan lenticel present. The fruit are a Samara born in pairs, so two Samaras, um, as you can see in the photo there. They get up to an inch long and they'll be green yellow to brown in color. The bark is smooth and gray when young to brown. And as they mature, they develop more of a scaly or platy bark. Number 10. Our last tree is shagbar hickory, Caria ovata. The leaves on this one are alternate, pinnately compound. They have five to seven leaflets that are finely serrated on the margin, and the underside can be somewhat hairy. It has football-shaped buds that are hairy and can get up to an inch long. So these are pretty large terminal buds anyway. The stems are stout, reddish brown to gray and somewhat hairy or smooth. The fruit is a nut and it's spherical getting up to two inches across and yellow green in color for the husk. When they're young, they have a smooth bark with orange kind of brown to brown splitting um, parts to the bark. As they mature, they develop a more shaggy bark. Um, not always as shaggy as that photo I put in there. That was one of the shaggiest shag barks I had come across, but they will have these kind of plates of the bark that peel outward from the bottom. Another really good one for bat habitat. And now we will get into some resources to help you with your tree ID. So probably the most important tree ID resource that you can have on hand is a dichotomous key. So dichotomous keys are kind of like an if-then map that you can use. You'll look at the tree parts, like what I discussed at the beginning of this presentation to kind of tell you what you're looking at. So a lot of these start with the leaves. So in the winter time, um, it'll be whether the leaves are present for say conifers or not present for um, deciduous trees. And then it'll just continue um, looking at the features of the leaf and other features that I discussed. So there are typically different keys for different seasons like winter, 
spring and summer will typically be together. Um, and even if you think you know what species you're looking at, it can be a good idea to go through one of these because there may be features on the tree that you just weren't aware of before. So it's just another feature you can kind of keep in mind for the next time you're out doing tree ID. And so this is our Forest Trees of Illinois book through Illinois Extension. Um, it's a great resource. It has many of our native species in it and they all have their own profile. So this is just one for white ash. So not only does it talk about all the features like I've discussed earlier, but it also talks about the wood uses for the tree, habitat, range, and sometimes in the distinguishing features, it'll have kind of good tips to differentiate it from another species that looks really similar, like green ash. Another great book that I like is Native Trees of the Midwest by Sally Weeks. So this is um, over the Midwest, so it's not just Illinois, but it's got great color photos included. It also has a dichotomous key um, in the back. And um, so I think sometimes the color photos help you out a little more. So this is one, it's a, it's a larger book. You probably don't wanna carry it when you're out in the field, but it's good to refer back to um, after a hike. I also recommend bringing binoculars, a pocket knife and a jeweler's loop or a magnifying glass with you if you're new to tree ID. Um, sometimes we can't get to the branches, so using binoculars to look at the leaf arrangement can be really helpful. A pocket knife can get you a look at the pith of those stems. And a jeweler's loop can be helpful if, you're, if the buds um, on the stem are quite small and you can't really see the features like the scales. Um, that can be really helpful. A lot of people like to use these smartphone apps for identification and um, they can be helpful. So this is just a few. I've personally used Seek and Google Lens um, for a variety of plants. Um, I would just say that in the winter time, these aren't the best resource because it's really the leaves, flowers and fruiting bodies that are gonna get you close to identifying what you're looking at with trees, looking at the bark and the buds. Um, oftentimes I don't get good results with those. So just keep that in mind. And with that, I will open it up for questions. <laughs> 